Is man a higher ape? Or is man a creature in the living image of God's creator by virtue of creative intellect? That is what the issue is. Are all men created in the living image of God the creator? Or are men merely beasts to be kept in zoos called, called nations? Beasts to be slaughtered when they're too numerous. Beasts to be used as chattels. That's the issue. in power have always tried to keep it the same way. Uh, to, uh, individualism is the, is the worst enemy of totalitarian systems. They will not tolerate it. And they can't tolerate it. Mao Zedong said the same thing when he was asked about the things that he feared. And he thought about it and he, said, he didn't fear weapons or guns or he said, I, I, I fear someone who's got a big idea. The same term that the Bush, George Bush, the two Bushes actually, the father and the son, both used in their speeches on the, a new world order. A big idea, they called it. Because in the circles, you see, who rule the world, in the club, you might say, it doesn't matter what party that you pretend to belong to, they're on the same club and they've gone through the same rituals, etc. But the big idea, of course, is someone who comes along and, and, and give, it comes up tonight. A religion, for instance, terrifies them. It, it terrifies them. Because believe it or not, religion will motivate people much quicker uh, faster, uniformly, so we'll cooperate th than anything else. Starvation won't do it the same way either. But for cooperating with each other uh, along a belief system, they'll do it. And it terrifies them. And so the first thing they have to do is, is destroy, destroy uh, the, 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 the real workable religions, the ones that worked and gave rights to the people. And when I get back to the ancient religions, the, the, the sun worship and so on, that's different altogether. These are the same characters that had sacrifices and so on. And the Christian world, it gave, for the first time, individual rights to people. Individual rights. And that's, that took a long time to ferment properly. They come down through time. And if you look at the end, into the 1800s, 1900s, and in Europe and in Britain especially, the changes that, that, that eventually came to be. And it took a long time to do so. And it's, it was never made perfect or not. But look, look at the changes they made uh, for the rights of people. That all came from Christian societies, including the abolition of slavery and things like that. It all came from the sea. So always for, don't forget the things that you're destroying now really were the end of, of a, an era. It came from the end of an era of Christian thought and conscience because the thought gives you conscience. Being a Christian gives you conscience. It doesn't justify the, the horrible societies that ruled over people, no doubt about it and use people just like cannon fodder for their wars and so on. Doesn't excuse it at all. But we've got to remember that basic, basic human rights all came from the same people. And now you're going backwards. Under the guise of conformity again for the planet. And keeping you all safe. And you have less rights than you did 20, 30 years ago. And it was done without your permission. It was all done with governments just, just passing laws amongst themselves at the top, uniformly, which were all drafted up before 9-11 even happened, apparently. You know, it came, came, that all came out too. Uncle. 
was in the explosion. He was in the lobby and then fucking the, the third explosion, the whole lobby collapsed on us. What was it like? What was it like? Horrible. It's like hell. You don't want to know. The whole building just collapsed on us inside the lobby. Is that a secondary explosion? Yes, it was. That was it the was planet Yeah, definitely a secondary explosion. But we was inside waiting to go upstairs. And on the way upstairs, the whole fucking thing blew. And we just, we just collapsed on everybody inside the lobby. Similar to the first tower coming down, secondary? I don't know about the first one, but I know the second one, was, it was terrible. Then there was a third one, too, after that one. And now you have uh, professionals uh, running our systems. The professionals have nothing to do with, with they have doctrines, they have nothing to do with democracy. Because as I said before, even the Club of Rome, the big think tank for the, for the big management of the planet and sustainable growth and etc. These, these characters are the ones who don't believe in democracy, said it doesn't work. The same thing, by the way, that you'll find that some of the, the, those who were put on trial at Nuremberg after World War II. If you ever go through, uh, and it's painstaking, of course, like most things are, you're painstaking to go through things, but you find that they kept going on and on and on trying to get people to confess to their to their ills and their evils in the Nazi party, the upper echelons of the Nazi party. And it was Goring, who had been the, the air chief. You know. uh, he, they kept it on and on about him, and he, he was definitely a bit of psychopathic, uh, uh, almost an actor type, hysterical type personality. He loved, to, he loved the show business type side of things. As a, as, a, as a leader, but he did say that the reason that Germany, in the middle of a mass depression, where nothing was working, and hyperinflation and all the rest, he said, he said the reason that they brought in the Nazi party and then they did away with, with the, the basic democratic rights, for, he says because democracy could not work at that time, you see. And basically, we're told the same thing after 9-11. They still use the term democracy, because you're still allowed to vote for leaders. Whether it's all real or not, it doesn't make any difference. I don't believe it's, it's all real. And um, I think it's very much like the, the Politburo of the Soviet system, because the joke was true. It's a true joke, but you get four folk to vote for, for the Politburo. A Politburo member, A, B, C, or D, all from the same one-party system. If you look at the systems today, you're really looking at the same global, when they all have the same things in mind, globalization for, for, and sustainable development with carbon taxes at the top, sustainable society, meaning, meaning population control big time, food control big time, wages control big time, all these things, energy controls big time. It's the same kind of system, folks. I don't care if they use democracy or not. But when they, when you, they don't have really a, a diverse goal between parties, then they're all really the same. Exactly what Carl Quigley said in his own book, Tragedy and Hope, that eventually the parties would all be spouting the same thing at election time to get in. As I say, we've never had... But, 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 I, I, I can remember giving the talks before 9-11 happened, and then... The, the week that, and the night and the week that 9-11 happened, and I knew there was a massive agenda going to be unrolled very quickly. And I said, the, the, the hardest thing you'll have from now on to do, and the hardest fight you'll have is to hold on to your sanity. Because everything, literally, that was has to be destroyed to bring in the new. And they don't want, uh, basically, a religion which steadies them and it steadies the people by giving them rules, basic rules of rights and wrongs, not, not just for an order, the order, whatever the order is they join, but literally an order for life and living itself. And most of the time they'll, they'll miss all, all of the, the points that are given out to them of improving themselves. Because often, improving yourself means you must give something up. And they don't have the patience to wait and see what happens by giving something up. 
and therefore the greatest things or miracles as used to be called will pass them by and, and they don't notice them or they don't experience them they don't have them and so they go deeper and deeper into invocations and sacrifices and terrible things like that to try and get that power encouraged at the top because anything you join that's a systematic system you know basically a formula also is a pyramid with the controls at the top you know all religions can go the same way with controls at the top when they get infiltrated or corrupt themselves and anything that's done by humankind always ends up corrupt anyway it's, it's human nature so there you go so in the morning, you throw off the controls of human nature, which are self-imposed and voluntary, then the more corrupt the system becomes. And if it wasn't for the folks who could see things and know things and come out with, with that what was happening, you'd have been run over by the system. The whole, a lot of us would have been run, completely run over by the system long ago. It's only by those who know and who watch and say something and can explain it that, that makes them have to, you know, they really grit their teeth and have to slow it down a bit here and there or adjust it here to get round you because uh, it's been pointed out what they're up to. The year is 1509. The League of Cambrai, representing the total combined power of Western Europe, is called upon by the papacy to crush Venice. At the Battle of Agnadello, the Venetian forces are completely destroyed. France is poised to invade the very islands that comprise Venice to deliver the coup de grace. The papacy relents, fearing a war that will be fought on Italian soil by foreign troops. Several times before, such troops have seized parts of Italy. In a series of diplomatic moves, the alliance falls apart, and, miraculously, Venice is saved. Venice, which worked with the Turks to create a republic of usury and slavery. Venice, the slave trader of Europe, so close to being destroyed, survived. Its survival would now wreak havoc on Western civilization. Modern history commences with Nicolaus of Giza and the Council of Florence, and the Italian Renaissance that Giza and his collaborators inspired. It was Giza, with the help of Pius II, who created the basis for a war on the pagan idea of man as a beast, and to defend the concept of man as a bigote at the past day. It was the power of these ideas which caused the greatest increase in human population in the history of man. This idea of the power of hypothesis and its relationship to transforming nature proved conclusively that man was fundamentally different from the beast, and as such could not be used as a slave. Venice reacted wildly against the ascendancy of this idea. With the papacy and the firm grip of Pius II and Giza, Venice launched a war to destroy Christianity. Contarini and the evil of Aristotle. The figure of Gasparo Contarini is the key one for Venice in its war. Contarini was trained at Padua University, the son of one of the oldest families in Venice. It was said of him that he was so versed in Aristotle, that if all of Aristotle's work were lost, he could reproduce it in its entirety. 
He learned his Aristotle from his mentor at Padua, Pietro Pomponesi. Every Venetian oligarchical family sent their children to Padua University to become trained Aristotelians. To understand Venice, you must understand that Aristotle is pure evil, and has been so since the time he wrote his diatribe against the method of Plato, approximately 2,300 years ago. Since Aristotle is almost unreadable, you must ask the question, what is it about Aristotle that has made his writings so influential in Western civilization? Aristotle is a thoroughgoing defense of oligarchical society. In his politics, Aristotle is most explicit. His theory of the purpose of politics is to maintain inequality. The state must carry on this natural idea and maintain it. The very basis for Aristotle's politics is the maintenance of the master-slave relationship, because it is, as he asserts, natural. That one should command and another be is both necessary and expedient. Indeed some things are so divided right from birth, some to rule, some to be ruled it is clear then that by nature some are free, others are slaves. And that for these it is both just and expedient that they should serve as slaves. One could accuse me of taking quotes out of context, but this would be false. It is true that even Plato makes a case for slavery, but, unlike Aristotle, Plato bases his state on the idea of justice. Just compare Aristotle's politics with Plato's Republic, where Plato from the very beginning launches a diatribe against arbitrary power. In the Thrasymachus section of the dialogue, he proves that the very basis for the Republic is a universal, that only universal ideas are fundamentally causal. That idea for the Republic, as he shows, must be based on the good. Since Aristotle is functioning within a philosophical environment created by Plato, he cannot throw out the concept of universals altogether. What he does instead, is to assign them to the realm of vita contemplativa, since they are not known by the senses, and we can only have faith in their existence. Contrast that to Plato, in which the ideas of the good and justice are causal, not contemplative and unknowable. These innate ideas, which in another dialogue Plato proves by showing a slave to possess them, are the very basis for the Republic. I contend that the reason Aristotle was so widely influential in Venice, is that Venice was a slave society based on the principle of oligarchism. Renaissance Christianity is the antithesis of this bestial conception. For Venice and Contarini, the Christian idea of man and the rejection of slavery and usury called their very existence into question, and they reacted with cold, hard evil in defense of their way of life. This is Gasparo Contarini. Contarini's Aristotelianism was highlighted by his early writings, in which he asserted, and in truth, I understood that even if I did all the penance I could end more, it would not suffice in the least to merit happiness or even render satisfaction for past sins truly I have arrived at the firm conclusion that nobody can become justified through his own works or cleansed from the desires in his own heart. In another letter, he calls man a worm. Radical Protestantism and Contarini's Catholicism are the Aristotelian split between Vita Contemplativa faith and Vita Activa works. Aristotelianism is a hatred of both God and man. It is remarkable that there was no real difference between him and Luther. Yet Contarini and several other Venetian noblemen later dominated the Reform Commission, which nominally prosecuted the War on the Reformation. Contarini was the creator of the Jesuits. Contarini's views were the essence of the spiritually movement, which was to dominate a section of the most powerful Venetian oligarchy. Let us now look briefly at Contarini's career, to understand how critical he is to Venice. Contarini was Venice's ambassador to the papacy. At another time he was the ambassador to the court of Charles V. He profiled both Charles V and the papacy. He was next appointed to the Council of Ten and later the Council of Three, the supreme ruling body of Venice. This council was justice in Venice. It ruled on all cases and could order assassinations. This was how Venice kept control of its oligarchical families. 
From the Council of Three, Contarini was appointed a cardinal. As a cardinal, he was first asked to create the Reformed Commission for the Council of Trent. He and four others spiritually dominated the commission. He was next appointed to negotiate with the Lutherans at Regensburg, at the behest of the Habsburg Emperor Charles in 1541. At Regensburg, he gave away the Venetian game. Contarini, in what was to be called Article 5, reiterated his Lutheran beliefs. It is a bit of an embarrassment that Calvin praised Article 5 at Regensburg. You will marvel when you read Article 5 that our adversaries have conceded so much nothing is to be found in it that does not stand in our own writings. Then, in typical Venetian fashion, Contarini created an Aristotelian, the deist, faction inside the church, which insisted that the only thing that separates Protestants from Catholics be reduced fundamentally to the question of the magisterium. It can now be stated what happened to the Renaissance. Venice manipulated both the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, leading to a series of wars which drowned the Renaissance legacy of Cusa and Pius II in a sea of blood that culminated in the Thirty Years' War. This war depopulated most of Europe. It set up the basis for an onslaught against Christianity, much like the cultural pessimism that dominated Europe after World War I. This Venetian evil was now to descend on England. The well-known secret of all the Whig insiders was that the Venetian takeover of England was a 200-year project beginning with the break of Henry VIII with Rome and concluding in 1714 with the accession to the throne of George I. The symbol of Genoa was St. George the Dragon Slayer, in reality no saint at all but a thinly disguised version of Perseus saving Andromeda by slaying the sea monster, a legend that is centered on the coast of Febanon. The George is said to come from the Gorgon Medusa, whose head Perseus was carrying. Perseus is in turn nothing but a westernized variant of Marduk, the Syrian Apollo, a deity associated with the most evil forces of ancient Assyria and Babylon. The Venetians had their own Marduk cult, although subordinated to St. Mark, on the island of San Giorgio Maggiore, home of a Dominican monastery and today of the Chini Foundation, one of the highest level think tanks in the world. The modern British preference of Gorgons is too well known to need comment. The culture of Europe was the root of the evil. Not some bad people. The culture itself was saturated with this. The Roman Empire, the Venetian system, the Dutch system, the British offshoot of the Dutch system. This is the evil. Their policies are the evil. So what happened? What changed this? What changed was what became the founding of what became the United States which was organized by people from just before the beginning of the 17th century. We're all guilty, in a sense, because we haven't done what had to be done. And we in the United States are the most guilty of all because we were the best qualified to do the job. But yeah, I mean, you've got one life to lead here, and if you don't use it, and if you're sitting waiting for someone to do it for you, why should any deity come along and say, I'll help you? But when you're saying, oh no, I don't care, people are suffering, I'm going to be okay, and I've been good, I've been good, you know, define good, what is good? And uh, God will do it all for me, and all the bad people would get punished in an afterlife. Well, I tell you, that is not scaring the bad people very much, is what I'm seeing today. And uh, Christianity was a, a revolutionary concept in its day. Revolutionary was the word. And the Romans were very confused over Christianity. And the, the, the danger to them was that Christianity taught that every individual was technically free in spirit and just as dear to God as a, a rich man or a powerful ruler. And, and even the slaves were taking this up uh, and believing in it too. So they saw trouble coming down the road where people would eventually demand their rights, which actually they did. So Christianity in its early form was a revolutionary idea. And the people, the early Christians, stood up for their values by getting thrown to lions and slaughtered in the rings and arena. 
uh, by the thousands, and that is facts. Well, that is well recorded. These guys literally could have given in any time and said, "Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll kiss the ring. I'll, I'll, I'll praise uh, the Caesar as a god," and they would have been let go. But none of them would do it. You could try that with the bunch that are living today, the smug bunch. What, what they believe. I will let the government do all that. It's all for the government. You're to sit here and just be nice and good and, and keep quiet. <laughs>